Today is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, and today's Mass we commemorate St. John Cancius, and also we add a third commemoration, which is for the propagation of the faith. We do it on this Sunday once a year. Preface of Preface of the Blessed Trinity. The epistle appointed for today's Mass is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 23 through 28. Brethren, be renewed the spirit of your mind and put on the new man according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak ye the truth, every man with his neighbor, for you are members of one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not, your sin, let not the sun go down upon your anger. Give not place to the devil. He that stole, let him now steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have something to give to him that suffereth need. The gospel appointed for today's Mass. Take the gospel of St. Matthew, in chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. At that time, Jesus spoke to the chief priests of the Pharisees in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who made a marriage for his son. And he sent his servants to call them that were invited to the marriage, and they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them that were invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my beeves and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come ye to the marriage. But they neglected and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the rest laid hands upon his servants, and having treated them contumeliously, put them to death. But when the king had heard of it, he was angry, and sending his armies, he destroyed those murderers, burnt their, and burnt their city. Then he saith to his servants, The marriage indeed is ready, but they that were invited were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as you shall find, call to the marriage. And the servants being gone forth into the ways, gathered together all that they found, both good, bad, both bad and good, and the marriage was filled with guests. And the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he saith to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? But he was silent. Then the king said to the waiters, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? But he was silent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The parable in today's Gospel shows that from most ancient times, our Lord picked the sacrament of matrimony, picked marriage, but marriages have been attended with great observance and festivities, uh, and there's various, of course, various customs. However, however, I suppose one could read that and you say, well, the, the, the king might have been a little bit harsh, uh, he maybe overreacted. But the point is, it was a story. The Lord told a parable, it's a story to convey some truth. And the truth is that we have to have on, not just physical, I mean, certainly I can talk about marriage, maybe I should do that too. But we have the, the physical, that we have not just the physical garment on for receiving the sacrament or attending there, but that the, the, the point is conveyed that we must be in the state of sanctifying grace. And indeed, we must make a point of doing so. Many are called, few, few are chosen. Theologians maintain this. When God created in the beginning, created the angels there to adore him, be him in heaven for all eternity. When that number fell, God, they believe, God had, had in his mind that there was to be a certain number of souls, of spirits, souls in heaven that would be with him for all eternity, that he could, they would be there surrounding him. When the angels fell, the, no, the numbers from heaven that were sent to hell had to be replaced, and so God created man. And then, of course, man sinned. And then God chose a, a particular race because they turned away from the worship of God. He chose a particular race, the Jewish race, the Hebrews. And he especially favored them that they would then fulfill that obligation of worshiping him. And they turned away, and then God opened up to the whole world. And you can see the parallel in, the, in today's parable. 
that he invited them. They didn't come, then he destroyed them, the angels, let's say. And then he compelled everyone to come. And he wants the, the wedding feast to be full. He wants heaven to be full of that number of souls. And then someone came with the, the feast without having his wedding garment on. In other words, not in the state of sanctifying grace. And throughout the Gospels, we'll see that reoccurrence occurring. That they didn't have on the wedding feast. They didn't have their lamps, the oil for the lamps. Uh, and various other comparisons our Lord used all to point out that we must be in the state of sanctifying grace. And indeed, without that, we have nothing. So we have time. We always have time, and we must use that time. If we want to go back just to the sacraments themselves, in the reception of the sacraments, we must, everyone, not just married, must be, have the proper dispositions in the various reception of the sacraments. If it is we go to want to receive the sacrament of penance, we go to the priest, and there we prepare ourselves for the reception of that sacrament. Not so much physically, but mentally we prepare ourselves. We go to Holy Communion, we prepare ourselves mentally, prepare ourselves, make sure it's in the state of sanctifying grace, and then we should have the proper decorum. And likewise marriage, and, and actually I can talk about marriage just a little bit. When it comes to marriage, it is such an important institution that affects us all one way or another. If we didn't have the sacrament of matrimony, we wouldn't have families, we wouldn't have children, the churches would be empty, heavens would not be filled, people would turn away from God, they would turn to worshiping false gods, all the, the evil that would come. Because if we do not worship God, I maintain if we don't worship God, we will worship something. And someone is determined that they, they don't need to worship God, believe me, they will worship something else. They will set something up as their God, whether it be money, whether it be their job, whatever it might be, they will idolize something. And so, but marriage is one of those sacraments that it hinges so much upon for everything. The fact that we have families. But so when, when, one, when one's going to enter into marriage, and most people will, then we must enter with a proper disposition. We must be prepared to achieve those ends which marriage was instituted. As our Lord told Adam and Eve, he says, multiply and fill the earth. And so take marriage. Marriage itself, in order to have a good marriage, we have to make proper preparations. Probably one of the first things we want to do is uh, go to the priest, go to the parish priest, and make known their intentions and it should give the priest some time to, to fulfill his obligations. The priest has an obligation to make sure that not just matrimony, but all the sacraments are received worthily. And upon uh, calling upon the priest, they should realize that the priest is not necessarily just going to rubber stamp their desires, but that he is restrained by the church. The church just didn't arbitrarily make up some laws, but we want to use nothing more than experience, the history of the church, the experience of the church throughout the years, they found out that if you want to have a good marriage, there are certain things that are going to be required. And the church laid down over the years determined that there are certain impediments that if they're there, the impediment is there, if it were not there and someone were to have such what we would call an impediment, but let's say the impediments were removed and those problems, if you will, those points that now we'd consider impediments, if they were not removed or if they remain there, it would lead to a, a bad marriage. So either for a number of reasons, it could lead to a, a poor marriage, a hard marriage, a tough marriage, possibly even marriage and a divorce. So there are, I'll just mention some of the problems. They would, for example, there's the lack of proper age. Such to get married at the proper age, they would not have the mental capacity to handle the obligations responsibility of marriage. And it could be certain physical defects such that it would hinder them fulfilling their duties as husband and wife. And of course, there's a bond of a previous marriage that would throw everything in a riot. It throws it into a wreck because now the, an obligation is made already, a promise is made to one, and now there's another. And then you have this disparity of worship or different religion. That leads to problems, real problems. If we don't have, can't agree 
if a couple can't agree on how to worship God or where to worship God or even what God to worship, it, that comes down to the core, the very core of how one believes. If you believe, you will act, it, act that belief out one way or another. If you believe that Allah is God, you will probably become a very violent person. If you believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is God, you will become a very kind person. And then, of course, if you've made other vows, let's say, as in holy orders or solemn vows in a religious life, and someone wants to get married after that, it, it once again causes problems. Or if there's, let's say, there, we don't hear about it so much, but let's say someone's actually, actually abducted or some crime committed. Let's say blood relationship, that has its own problem if one wants to marry one's blood relative. And then there's this spiritual relationship. Uh, one is adopted. Adoption, you can say, well, they're not blood related, but adoption has its own problems, if you will. And so the church doesn't want adopted to, to marry in a family, for example. Uh, fallen away Catholic, some public sinner, uh, someone is excommunicated. Each one has its own problems. So when the, when, the, when the couple comes to a priest and they say they want to get married, the, the, the priest himself wants to make sure there is no impediment that would cause a problem that would come forward later on in life. So he's trying to remove those. As I would tell people, I says, what, I'd, I'd ask actually a question, I says, what, 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 you, what kind of baggage? Now, the word impediment uh, in Latin actually is considered baggage. That's how you translate impediment. It's baggage. Aside from, the, in fact, impediment we'd use as an obstacle which baggage is it? And it goes back, actually, but anyway, the etymology word goes back. But that being said, the priest wants to know what it is so he can maybe get rid of, remove, or might just say, well, you can't get married. And before the, in fact, before the priest is permitted to even witness a marriage, he has to be convinced. And over the years, I found that uh, sometimes there are those who want to get married with less than proper dispositions and I've even come to realize that sometimes they'll, some people they will try to tell the priest what they think he wants to hear and they can do it they can deceive the priest but you can deceive the priest but you can't deceive God and even though they may deceive try to portray, portray things in a good light try to lessen the evils whatever it might be it'll come back to use a common expression it'll come back to bite him it'll come back sometimes with a real vengeance. So before, but the point is, before a priest is even permit, permitted to witness a marriage, he has to be convinced morally, as much as morally possible, because once again, someone could deceive, as we could all be deceived uh, by the priest, but as much as humanly possible, he should be convinced that that marriage will last, that they'll fulfill their obligations, temporal obligations as well as the spirituals. Temple would be fulfilling the marriage as husband and wife, as mother and father. Spiritual, their obligations toward the church, raising their children as Catholic, teaching them the faith, uh, giving them standards and principles to live by. Especially this is true if one of the parties is non-Catholic. And even though they may sign the papers, the priest has to be convinced. And he tries to be generous in this matter. He doesn't want to overreact or in any way misjudge or rash judge from his lack of knowledge, but he has to be, human, as much as humanly possible, as convinced that that marriage is going to last. And the church requires uh, that when the couple does get married, just as in a general thing, just talk about marriage just briefly, and I can talk about the other sacraments too, but the church requires that when a couple get married, they must be in front of a priest a Catholic couple must be from a priest and two witnesses. And require that it does not take place during certain forbidden times. Just not so much that one couldn't get married during Lent or during Advent, but just it, it's sort of a, the very idea of a marriage is one of great public rejoicing because it is a public affair and is a real rule because now we have a new family, uh, let's say in the parish, in the community. And it sort of takes away from the, from the penitential character of Lent and, and, and Advent. So the church doesn't want marriages to take place then. But just keep with marriage, it's the idea of marriage. When someone wants to get married, they should enter into the marriage in preparation of the marriage with proper disposition. Over the years, and what I've read in the past is that when someone's going to get married, 
those who have less than ideal motives for getting married, before the marriage, they think it's almost like a license to go out and run wild. It's like Halloween is a license to run wild and do evil things because now tomorrow is going to be All Saints Day. But All Souls Day, or the next day is going to be, they, they do such weird things. And for example, in Detroit, they have uh, Eve of All Saints, and it's Halloween in the secular world. Then they have, I believe it's the night before, they have what they call Devil's Night. Almost implying that we can go out and act like devils. And apparently in Detroit years ago anyway, they would go out and raise mayhem uh, out of, around the streets wherever they might be. The idea that has come in is, is that when marriage is some people do the same thing. They have Devil's Night before they get married. Or, or Halloween where they can act out differently than what they really should. And it caused a lot of mayhem. So we don't need such action as that. So when one gets married, one has to have that forethought and that preparation that if you want to get a good marriage, you have to have a good foundation for a good marriage. If you're going to build a house on sand, the ha house is going to fall in. If you want to build a house on a solid foundation, the house will last. The same thing with marriage. You can't build a marriage on sand. You can't build a marriage on falsehood. You can't build a marriage on lies. You, can't, you have to build marriage on a solid foundation. And the solid foundation is, first off, you have to have a solid characters of the individual. You can't have someone who would act as a child, who would want to have their devil's night out or their Halloween, and then expect to come in with all the solemnity and the seriousness of a marriage and expect it to be if you're having two different, two different ideas of how they, what they can do or can't do, what's, it, it leads to all kinds of problems inside of marriage. So inside of marriage, just as in today's gospel, we have to have on the wedding garment. We go to the, to the marriage, we go to the marriage feast, and there we have on the wedding garment. So we have, have the proper decorum, both interior and exterior. Marriage is not just some, uh, some, uh, some merely uh, some civil contract. It's a, really an occasion of social rejoicing, but it is a sacrament. It is a sacrament. It is the very word sacrament, sacra, is sacred. It is a sacred thing. Even though Hollywood and the rest of the world, the pagan world, looks at it a different, they look at it as a license to commit evil, it is a sacred thing and should be celebrated in a manner befitting of a sacred character. Especially out of place would be unbecoming amusements and dissipations. But this, of course, is with all the sacraments. We're going to receive Holy Communion, go to receive Confirmation. We have to go with the proper dispositions, the proper preparations, and then we'll benefit from uh, that after the marriage, after the reception of the sacraments. And if one wants to obtain the blessings of the married life, wants to obtain the blessings of, of receiving any of the sacraments, then upon receiving the sacrament, whether it be marriage or confirmation or any other sacrament, it should be entered into with devout sentiments, I would say feelings of respect and reverence, and then God will bless that sacrament, will bless that person who receives that sacrament with such devotions, uh, that there the grace will be there and they will reap it. If inside of marriage, they'll reap it by having a happy marriage. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.